Hey there, friends. Welcome to the Being Brown and Bold podcast. I am your host, Jess Thomas. We are so glad that you are joining us for all our amazing conversations about stepping out of our comfort zone, being bold, and taking chances. Today, I get to chat with Hethel Fasabada. She is a Jersey native who has adopted the Bay Area as her home. She gained popularity after competing on the show Master Chef. She wrote the cookbook, Milk and Cardamom, which was named one of the top cookbooks of 2019 by the Washington Post and the San Francisco Chronicle. Her recipes have been featured in the New York Times, Food and Wine Magazine, Bon Appetit, Tasty, and so much more. Her online bakery sent yummy treats, including her famous gulab jamun cake around the country. You can find her on Instagram and watch her cooking demonstrations, but also you can see her dosha making husband and her fabulous daughter. I have been inspired by her food, her travels, her family, and just her honesty about doing real life. So Hethel, it is so great to have you today on the podcast. Thanks so much for having me, Jess. I appreciate it. I have been, follow- I feel like I started following you before the pandemic, but mm-hmm. I feel like it was during the pandemic that you just opened so many worlds for me because <laughs> um, you're from Jersey, I'm from Long Island, uh-huh. but I grew up in a complete Kerala Malayali culture. And even though I had Gujarati friends in college, I didn't really understand Gujarati culture. So it was so cool how you were sharing about your life um, with language and food. And I was like, there's so much for me to learn. And you kind of opened that door for me. And so I'm just so thankful for you and and what you've been doing. Yeah, I I feel like I built like a such a huge Gujarati like community. Like it's just a Gujus are known for being very hospitable and loud and rambunctious and just kind of like we're big group hug people and like, you know, gather. So I feel like I just kind of brought that same vibe to my Instagram community. <laughs> and I felt it. I mean, I, I totally felt it. I didn't feel like I was an outsider looking in. I felt like you were inviting me into that community, which was amazing. Oh, yeah. So I'm always welcome to the Guju cookout. <laughs> thank you. So yeah, tell us a little bit about yourself. What does it mean to be you? Um, So I am a mom, um, daughter. I feel like so much of my definition for a very long time, and I think for a lot of these women is like our relationships, right? Mm -hmm. Eldest daughter, Mm, you know, that means like lots of pressure. You have to take care of a lot of people. Uh, you're running the house really, especially if you're, you know, um, the daughter of an immigrant, uh, and then, you know, sister, which sometimes turns into like also second parent, if you're the big sister, (laughs) right. Right. Um, I guess for me, it's just about, um, taking people, taking care of the people around me, but also I'm learning now more, especially now that I'm getting older to take care of me too and not like burn myself out. But um, what it what does it mean to be me? It means to have a very spontaneous, bright, colorful and full life. And that means like full of food, full of people and sometimes just me. <laughs> yeah. And I think that's one of the cool things I've watched on your page, the color, the color in your food. And now with your new house and how you did the remodel and the color everywhere, the clothing, your sister's in um, clothing and like seeing her color. It's been so fun to see that because I think we've lived in this Western culture recently more of like earth tones and like everything. And I know I have a lot of black and like brown clothes. I don't have a lot of color. And it's been, I think it's I'm scared of color. Cause I don't know how to do it well, or I'm afraid I'm going to put the, the wrong colors together, but it's been fun. I feel like what you've shown me is there's no rules. Like you do what you like. Yeah. If it looks good to you, that's it. That's all that matters. Which is kind of like wine. If you like it, then drink it. Like, does it have yeah. to be a certain vintage or anyway? Yeah. Um, maybe if you can share a little bit about your cultural heritage for those who don't Um, know you and how it has informed your work and your life. Yeah. So I grew up in a big Gujarat, the household Gujarat is the, uh, is a state in India. It's on the West side. It's a little like peninsula slash knob that hangs off the West coast of India. 
And um, my family specifically is from the Sodasht, which is like the central portion of that peninsula. Um, uh, my parents both were blue collar, you know, like labor workers. And I grew up in a house in Jersey, which was always full with either like my kakakakis, like my dad's brother's family or my mom's side. And I have a huge family. My dad's got like six brothers and two sisters. And my mom's got six sisters and a brother. And at any given point in my life, one of them lived with me and their entire family. So we had at least like 10 to 15 people in our house pretty much up until I was in college. Um, so I grew up with a really big house. Um, and that meant lots of big dinners, lots of gatherings. I think we all got together like on a weekly basis. My cousins were more like brothers and sisters to me than they were really cousins, which I find really interesting because Root grew up in a very different type of family where like he saw his cousins maybe once or twice a year. And I was like in my cousin's face, like, like summer, I'm just figuring out camps now. I, I don't know if you went through this where like you have to put your kids in camp every week. To we did it. Busy. I didn't go to camp. And... I didn't. I was a cousin. I went to cousin's house. Yeah. Or like you were sent to, you for a week with a relative for like a week. And you go yeah. to the next one until they're yeah. sick of you. Exactly. But, um, yeah, it, we were just, it was a very close knit family and we learned to do things together. So for me growing up, it was very much um, taking care of everyone type of, like my, all the women in our family took care of everyone. They were packing everyone's lunch. They were taking care of everyone in the morning. Like the culture I grew up in was extremely, um, I would say very DC because anyone that was coming and living with us was coming straight from India, okay. you know? Um, so it was a lot of Gujarati food every single day, fresh, fresh dal bhat chakrotli every night. Um, but it was also a lot of laughing and joy and, um, just like, like, I like the house full. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's kind of how I grew up is, you know, if you're making something, you don't ever make something just for yourself. Right. Right. You make enough for everyone or you don't make it at all. <laughs> mm -hmm. So then when you were little, did you imagine like your household that you lived would also be filled with lots of people coming out and especially Desi people, because that doesn't seem to be the case where you are now. Yeah. Growing up, I always assumed that I would be living next to my best friends who are also good. <laughs> mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we'd all raise our kids together and all my cousins would be nearby and, We'd all like never leave this beautiful bubble that we had created. Yeah. Um, and obviously real life happens, job opportunities take you elsewhere, spouses take you elsewhere, you know, life goes on. Right. Um, and I think it hit me, like I was at a cousin's wedding two weeks ago and I was saying goodbye to everyone at the reception. And I just like start bawling because this is like my little cousin who's getting married, who I used to spend Aww. every summer with. Aww. And I'm like, I don't get to see them. Oh my, I want to cry now. Yeah. <laughs> like yeah. I I don't yeah. get to see them as much as I wish I could. And everyone's like, because when I'm home in Jersey, it's almost like an excuse for all of us to get together again. Right. And like my cousins joke that like, Hathal, you know, if you still lived in Jersey, we'd probably be having weekend jamwanus or like dinner parties like we used to when we were younger. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, you're probably not wrong. Um, I have one cousin luckily who moved out here who I see you know, at least once or twice a month, but I never imagined, you know, having, um, not having family near me, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It was never in my card. Um, and it was definitely a hard decision to make, but I think we've also now our chosen family. Like I have friends that have become family here. And mm -hmm. yeah, I think that's a, cause a, a lot of the families I grew up, Indian families I grew up with, um, in New York, they all stayed there. They bought their houses near each other. Everybody lives within 20 minutes of each other. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm the only one that like really, my brother left too, but he's in Connecticut. So that doesn't, yeah. that's nearby. Um, but I've been in Tennessee for 23 years and uh, my parents will be like, do you want to move back? I'm like, I actually don't want to move back because I do like the life and the lifestyle and the people. Yeah 
that I'm surrounded with here. It's not that I don't love everybody, but it's different. And then I think, but you left your parents. I don't know about if your grandparents are around, but my grandparents yeah. didn't come to America. And um, a bunch of my, both my parents' siblings didn't come to America. Like at like 17, you left Kerala and went to Calcutta mm -hmm. for school. Mm -hmm. You didn't even go back home to get married. You got married in Calcutta, you went to Delhi, and then you came to America. Yeah. And so yeah. you kind of set the standard for me that I'm like hundreds and hundreds of miles away. Yeah, 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 yeah. 100%. I mean, uh, like my, the thing is my parents fully understood. They, I don't, they've never asked me to stay in New Jersey or even consider moving back mm -hmm. ever. Now I think about it. And I think it's just because they understood like, oh, that's where the opportunities are. But it's also a place where like, I feel safe here in California. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, like in the sense of, uh, I mean, politics, which is obviously a big concern now, mm -hmm. um, especially like state politics, like it, but also the kind of things that can expose Ilara to, you know, like right. growing up in Jersey, there wasn't really like all that much nature and things to do. You get, you mm -hmm. maybe go to the boardwalk in the summers, but like, I don't think I actually didn't go hiking until I was in college. Yeah, same. I didn't <laughs> either. And now I live in like, there's like, the Great Smoky National yeah. Park nearby. There's the um, big South Fork Park nearby. Like I'm surrounded by it. And yeah. it's my favorite way to exercise. But I mean, I don't know if it's because growing up Daisy, Jones Beach was 20 minutes from my house and I didn't even know it. I used to go there when I was little. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, then you went more than me. Like I didn't even realize the beach was that close. I'm like, how is it that I lived that close to the beach? And our family never went because it just wasn't. Yeah. Fit, you know, because well, everybody's busy working. It was that mixed with obviously a little bit of modesty issues, right? Like, oh, we don't want mm. you to see people in bikinis and stuff. I mean, yeah. I went into the pool and in the ocean in a t-shirt and shorts and not even oh, just yeah. like basketball shorts, like long <laughs> knee covering. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but there, yeah, there's this, I feel like for Ilara, the opportunities she gets here, I think significantly more than what she would get in. New Jersey. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, the school system in Jersey is great. I'm a product of it. Um, but when it comes to the outdoors, I, I want her to be like out in nature. It's kind of also, she loves it. That's like where she thrives. Yeah. Yeah. It is fun to watch Ilara blossoming. Cause I feel like I've known her, you know, her whole life. <laughs> <laughs> um, but like going back to when you were growing up in Jersey, um, especially coming from a DC background, did you have any difficulties about choosing a career path because maybe there were certain expectations either you put on yourself or like other people put on you? Oh, 100%. Uh, I remember being in, I think it was first or second grade, we had to do report on what we wanted to be when we we're older. And I wanted to be an archeologist. Everything about archeology span like, was like super cool to me. I'm like, I like being in the dirt. I like to find fossils. I like history. Like it, I was like, I'm going to be an archaeologist. Well, you know how Desi parents are. They take everything everyone says seriously. Right. Um, well, I told my mom that, and I did a full report on wanting to be an archaeologist. Like one of my favorite, I think it was um, Aliki had a book, I think on archaeology or maybe it's some, I think it was Aliki, but um, like a little kid's book uh -huh. about paleontology and archaeology. And, um, my mom took me to my mama's house, her like cousin brother who sat me down and told me why I couldn't be an archeologist. Wow. I was in like first or second grade <laughs> and telling me that like, they don't make money. How would you even do that? Da, 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 da. It's not funny. I'm in elementary school, dude. Right. <laughs> Let me dream. Right. But Aww. no, I feel like this was like a, I think a lot of Daisy kids went through it, right? Where like, you know, there was no dreaming unless it was the same dream as them. Yeah. Um, you know, do you think it was their fear of like, we want you to have a secure financial situation and maybe archaeology is not going to get you there? Yeah. It's that plus lack of education. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. They've never seen a DC in that field succeed. They don't even understand the field itself. They don't know anything about it, nor do they have the means to, at that time, even do research. My parents barely spoke English. 
Mm. You could read. Uh, it's not like they're going to be like, oh, what is this? Let me look into it. Mm, let me take my daughter to a natural history museum. Let me learn more about it. There was none <laughs> of that. It was, I know nothing, thus you are not doing it. Yeah. Hmm. That's kind you of know? heartbreaking to like have your dreams stomped on at that age. Yeah. So after that, I didn't really ever say anything. And then the only careers I was ever uh, exposed to was doctor and pharmacy um, and like business ownership, like mm -hmm. you know, owning grocery stores and convenience stores and stuff. Mm -hmm. But um, I didn't know like consulting was an option. I didn't know food chemistry was not, I didn't know any of this. I didn't mm -hmm. even know that I could like major in food science. Um, and again, that's lack of exposure. And like my parents didn't know any better and I didn't know any better. Mm -hmm. Um, but I then was like, fine, I'll go into healthcare. That seems the next most interesting thing to me mm -hmm. and that my parents supported, but one, I was definitely not smart enough. Um, like I wasn't the 4.0 like kid at all. Me at neither. all. <laughs> I was the like 3.75 kid with a ton of extracurriculars. And like, yes. <laughs> that was me. I was like president of every club, fundraising for everything. Like mm -hmm. my scholarships were, scholarships were based on like volunteering, like humanitarian right. awards. None of them were academic. Same. Yeah. So it's not the smart enough though. I think it's the way that our brains work. It's like projects and hands-on things versus like memorizing yeah. all these things from books. Yeah, right? I always did better in classes where there was a lab involved. Mm -hmm. um, anything that requir required like straight up memorization wasn't for me. Right. Um, I mean, I could memorize things. I became good at it. I like flexed that muscle in college and like worked my way up to being good at it. But like, that was something I had to teach myself. Um, and you mix that with like, I'm like seeing the differences between like how Ilar is growing up and how I grew up. Like uh, my mom and dad couldn't sit with me and do my homework with me. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They didn't know what any of that meant. Right. Uh, it's not like I could be like, mommy, I don't know how to do this math. Right. She doesn't know either. Right. <laughs> so, and now like Ruth's like, you need to sit and do homework with Ilar. And I'm like, I don't even know what that looks like. Mm-hmm. Uh, like how do I do Google it? though? <laughs> yeah. I'm like, do I just sit with her and watch her do it? Do I correct her mistakes? Do I walk her through like each problem? Like how, like I have to consciously think about like, oh yeah, no, I need to just now sit with her and do this. Mm -hmm. um, it's interesting you said that because um, uh, we homeschooled our kids mm -hmm. and I remember at a certain point, maybe they were like middle school-ish that- yeah. I was doing a lot of things for them. And one of my other friends is like, why are you doing all that stuff? Like they should be grading their own stuff. I'm like, you can, you're allowed to do that. Like just give them the answer sheet and they grade it themselves. And if they cheat, oh, well, like they're cheap, you know, like they're missing out if they understand that concept. So it's kind of teaching them integrity, um, but then also to not help them with anything until they ask. Cause then they're like, did your mom help you with all your stuff or your dad? I'm like, no, they did it. They didn't help me with anything, yeah. but I remember wishing they would, I think. And so it's trying to figure out how can you be present with your kid and part of their life, academic, like, like every part of their life, but not helicoptering either so that they are able to develop those skills. Yep. 100%. Like I want her to know how to like figure things out on her own mm -hmm. um, and, you know, look up stuff and figure it like, I don't want her to use me or as a crutch. Um, but yeah, like as a career, I always thought I was going to be in healthcare. I went to school and did biochemistry, assuming I was going to be like a PA or something or NP. Um, I even did my uh, master's at like a, a PCOM, Philadelphia College of Osteopathic Medicine, assuming still that I would like be a PA. Uh, <laughs> I ended up not doing it. And I got waitlisted and then I just never came off the waitlist. So I was like, okay, well, I guess I'll just start working. Hmm. Um, looking back at it now, I wish I did something like food chemistry or like new. Um, I wish I knew what my options were. 
Mm-hmm. And I wish I was exposed more. And like, that's something I can do for you, Laura, now. Yeah. yeah. If you went into food chemistry, what do you think you would have ended up doing job-wise? I think I probably would have ended up working for like, um, probably Matson or like maybe even try and go into, oh my God, whose lab is it in Seattle? The modern cuisines guy. Oh yeah. Uh-huh. Modernist. Yep. Yeah. Like modern. That would be fun. Cuisines. Like I can see myself doing something like working in the restaurant industry with, as a food chemist, mm-hmm. you know, um, versus like being at like Nabisco trying to figure out how to make a cookie last on the shelf for 500 years. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and what chemicals can you put in it that makes it taste like crap that you keep wanting to buy more. Yeah, exactly. I'm like, I I feel like I'd be more in the food slash restaurant side versus being, um, in the, uh, like science, science, hardcore science lab. Mm -hmm. So this minute, what would you say is your job? Root says food entrepreneur. Yeah. He's like, you have too many things going on that you can, you can't, I can't say I'm a food writer because I do more than that. I can't say I'm a recipe developer because I do more. So I am a food entrepreneur. I run a bakery. I do um, food photography, food styling, recipe development, food writing, um, blogging, content creator, all of the above. I just like being in food. Yeah. Is there any one of those things that you absolutely love? Because I know it some point you had talked about possibly brick and mortar bakery. Um, but I feel like watching you, you've done so many things and I can't figure out which you love because you're good at all of them, but you know, like you can be good at something, but you're like, "Eh, I just do it. I love doing the content and like build work, like meeting and creating community on like the internet. Um, mass producing cakes is not very joyful for me. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Uh, The idea of having to take out literally a second mortgage to try and do a brick and mortar here in the Bay, like it's two mil minimum. Wow. So that's never happening. Um, But what I've loved is like collaborating, building community. And that's all happened through content creation on Instagram Mm -hmm. and like meeting others. Um, And that's probably my favorite aspect of it. That and like, I love doing pop-ups that those are fun too. Yeah. The events, one-off events here and there. Do you like traveling and doing pop-ups or like more in your area? Oh, traveling and pop-ups. Like, do you see yourself doing that more as Alara gets older? Yeah. 100%. I want to do it a lot more often. I have so many friends across the country that are amazing chefs or like amazing content creators. I'd love to do events with them, do events from like, I, I want to take it from like Insta to in real life. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's really fun. Um, yeah, because I, I I mean, I've made your glab jamun cake so many times and everybody's like, this is amazing. Is this pound cake? I'm like, no, it's glab jamun cake. And then I'm explaining it. And I'm like, you should look up Hethel because she's like, I feel like you have really good taste buds. So you know what flavors people really enjoy. And that's why your recipes are so good because it's, what most people would like to eat. Thanks. Yeah. I I mean, I'm going for like, as our moms would say, not too sweet and just hit all the right, you know, fresh or comfort. Like I, I, I thrive for a feel and then figure out how to get there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, okay. I want to rewind a little bit, like in this food uh, journey that you were on, I actually remember watching you, we don't have TV. We don't have like regular stations. And this is pre, you were on MasterChef before there was like real streaming. Yeah. Um, and so, but I remember we were at a hotel and MasterChef was on, I was watching. I'm like, there's an Indian woman on, the, there's an Indian woman on this show. And I was so <laughs> excited. You didn't look excited to be on the show, that specific <laughs> episode, but I mean, nobody else did either. Like everybody's like focused, right? Mm-hmm. But I remember being so encouraged to see this brown face on this TV competition. Um, so one, especially for me back then, I was like, this is amazing. Like, it's so glamorous, like the TV life. Um, so maybe if you can share some of those experiences and what would you say to people who think, oh, yeah, 
the TV lift must be like so glamorous. Well, the experience was definitely once in a lifetime type of experience. Uh, being on the show was definitely not glamorous by any means. We were sleep deprived, food deprived, all just deprived in general. Yeah. Um, cause to make good TV, I don't know if anyone watches like, was it unreal is the show, but mm. the, it's like about producers for like a bachelorette-esque TV show, but you even see, see it now too. A lot more people coming out about like the abuse that reality TV show contestants have been getting people from like America's next top model and, um, bachelor and all those, mm. uh, yeah, you're not getting paid to be on the TV, by the way. I think we got paid $40 a day. Um, and that was like our food stipend. But we couldn't even really use it that often because we weren't allowed to leave the hotel or the studio premises without someone. Yeah, I don't think people realize that. I think people think, yeah. oh, you're on TV. You must make good money. No. <laughs> um, I get nothing. Anytime a show airs, I don't get a residual. I get nothing. Um reality they're utilizing us to make money for themselves uh the other thing is it's a game mm -hmm. so like you go in thinking that like you give them the benefit of the doubt thinking it's all real in the sense that the person who makes the best food really does win a lot of the times it's really who can mentally handle it the longest mm -hmm. I mean my season I'm not gonna lie Claudia is like one of the best chefs like her food was amazing. I would absolutely eat anything she would give me. She's just fabulous, but it is a mental part of it is real. And also like how you treat the staff and how you treat the producers. And are you on time? And are you giving them trouble? Maybe one of your foods is just not going to taste good. Your meat's just a little dry. Um, and like, you could tell as we were filming, like who was going to get kicked off next. Mm -hmm based on how the judges treated that person. Right. So like my elimination, I knew I was next based on what the judges were doing. Mm. They were put in snide remarks. If you can't taste your food, you can't be a good chef. Knowing that I couldn't taste half the food that I was making. Right. Or, um, for those who don't know, it's because Heather is vegetarian. And yes. so they were making her cook meat. So she's cooking yeah. it without mm -hmm. tasting it. Yeah. But I know, I remember one of them, you totally nailed and they were like shocked. Mm -hmm. And, and, and they would just say these, and they also like during the challenge, you would see the judges go help certain people, but then not help others. And you're like, okay, yeah, I'm next. Um, like you, you knew what was happening. Like there was definitely, uh, some, it's a show, it's right? A show. It's a Hollywood show. So what makes for a good story? Exactly. Um, there's definitely guiding that occurred. Um, and then the other thing is like, I was asked to come back again this year for back to win. And like after months and months of going back and forth between their lawyers and, uh, mine, it was a hell no. Um, the contracts are absolutely predatory. Mm. They want, you know, an, percentage of your income for X amount of years, but the opportunity to extend that even further in perpetuity, they want access to, they want ownership of your image and any NFTs that are created on it. Wow. Um, they get to yay or nay any job that you get in the future for the X amount of years. So like, say you want to, I wasn't allowed to do YouTube for the first three years after MasterChef. Uh, wow. It's a business conflict. Yeah. Um, I guess that's different now. Cause like you see a lot of folks now coming off of MasterChef and building a really big name for themselves on like TikTok or Instagram. That wasn't an option for me. Mm. I had like still photos. So I could use Instagram for still photos, but it's not like I had video access. Mm -hmm. you know, mm. Like Nick Giovanni, who's got like millions of followers now after he came off of MasterChef, mm -hmm. but like he could get around the YouTube aspect by doing it on TikTok. You know? Wow. Yeah. Uh, so there's a lot of restrictions. So people think like, oh, when I come off, I'm going to be able to make all this money and get all these interviews. Guess what? You can't even reach out to press. You can only do interviews if they reach out to you. And if people don't know you're on the radar, they're not they reaching out to you. Right. Um, and they get to yay or nay any interviews you do. So like, just know what you're getting into. You could get a big break, but I would say 95% of the people go back to their original job. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Working on Chopped, 
behind the scenes, I'm watching all these chefs come and, you know, first thing in the morning, they're, they're really early and they're so excited. Like this is the big break, even if they didn't win, like I'm going to be on TV, like this is my chance. But a lot of them, you don't hear, you know, your friends and family watch and that, that's yeah. really cool, but it's not necessarily going to help you in your career. No, it's something you can add to your resume and say like, oh, chopped champion or whatever. Um, For me, MasterChef didn't really like open doors, but it definitely got my foot in the door in the sense of like, people would talk to me and then they hear MasterChef and they're like, actually, let's talk further. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. Kind of thing, you know, it gives you credibility. Yeah. I think that's what it is. Being on TV in whatever way gives you, cause it's not just YouTube. Cause anybody can be on YouTube, but like, Oh, yeah. you are actually on TV. Mm-hmm. So I feel like people who don't know the industry feels like, Oh, they must be an authority because otherwise they wouldn't be on TV. Yeah. yeah. And also like filming feels like a fever dream. Cause you're like, what you learn like half the stage is put together with like spit and duct tape <laughs> none of that stuff is real the sinks in the master chef kitchen don't work like there's a bucket oh, wow. underneath them that catch water and they tell you don't use too much water oh wow no ours was a real sink unchopped ours is not a real sink yeah. uh we couldn't boil water so they gave us kettles of hot water that we could then bring up because there wasn't enough water oh to like fill like it's all duct tape and spit and glue wow when the doors that wide open wide when everyone enters it's two people holding it hoping that they you know open it at the same time (laughs) it's not even automatic it's just like okay two people are gonna pull it apart that you walk through and the back end of it's all plywood (laughs) we had a door on top that was like a a rope attached that they Uh would fall yeah yep Uh, (laughs) um It was all, yeah. You learn how much of it is staged. And now I watch TV, reality TV, because I love reality TV. I mean, yeah, I was on it, but I love it because it's just a good escape. Mm-hmm. But I watch it all with a grain of salt. The only times, like, because I know how editing can make you look. They took some of like the most rude people from my season and made them look like angels mm-hmm. and some of the most sweetest people and made them look like terrible people. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, editing is half the story of whatever they want to create. Oh, 100%. I mean, they they made me look like a good, timid South Asian girl. That Which we cool. all know. You're so timid. Right? <laughs> and it's like they cut out all my to speak fights. your thoughts, right? <laughs> yeah. They like took out all my fights, all my cursing. Um, That's hilarious. Yeah. Wow. But it's the personality they create. I mean, my clothes weren't even mine. Like three of the outfits from the entire season were mine. The rest was all wardrobe. Wow. Um, so they are building a persona for you. Mm -hmm. And that unfortunately, like not everyone's persona matches who they actually are in real life. Mm -hmm. Um, which can suck. I think the worst part of it is really, you put yourself out there and then America goes crazy on social media. Mm-hmm. Like the amount of like racist stuff that me and Claudia um and Shelly from my scene got was insane. Oh, all she does is cook Indian food. She can't be master chef. Meanwhile, you have an Italian guy making pasta every freaking thing, but no, you're not gonna say nothing about him. Right. 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 It's uh, interesting the rules people in their head think are accurate of like um, like what is fine dining? Who decides what is fine dining? If we make a curry that's been slow mm-hmm. cooked and and done the spices and it's taken us four hours, why is that not considered fine dining if you can't plate it a certain way? Yeah, exactly. And the other thing is people always want to shit on the vegetarian, mm-hmm. right? They want to make fun of the vegan. They want to make, now it's all of a sudden, oh, this is cool. Sustainability, like eat, like, now they'll won't poke as much fun at it, mm-hmm. but they used to absolutely do things to get a rise out of me. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and 
I was not bothered. I was like, I'm not going to go there. I remember having a conversation with one of my hook contestants. I'm like, they're trying to make you look at like the angry black girl. Do mm. not look at them. Mm-hmm. And you can see they're poking at her consistently. And I'm like, don't, don't do it. Don't give it to them. And right. we discuss it. Cause like, these were all things that unfortunately happened. And then uh, like MasterChef does not, uh, what do you call it? Like surveil their uh, message boards on like Facebook or Twitter. Mm. So anyone could say anything horrendously racist, horrendously awful, absolutely disgusting. And it never gets deleted. There's no like, Hey, Mm. we should be saying these things about people. That's not okay. Um, No anti-bully policy that a lot of reality shows like across in like England, Australia have, um, which is why I was like, I don't think I'm coming back this year. Sorry, like contract and also like how you run certain aspects of the, uh, the master chef sphere. I I can't, I can't do Mm -hmm. it. Yeah. Yeah. Would you ever want your own show where it's like a cooking show? Like you're in charge. Like, yeah. 100%. I would love that. Yeah. I would love that. I would love learning from others. I would love sharing recipes. Um, Someone on my Instagram recently was like, I I would watch a show about you going to all the different little Indias across the world. And I'm like, I would love that. That would be great. Yeah. I would love that. Or, you know, doing one where I I feature um, different uh, village foods from different places, you Mm -hmm. know, like the food that's like in the village village, whether it be India or Mexico or um, China, whatever. Like I, I love the concept of, village cooking because to me that is the most uh real food to me in the sense that it it was always farm to table from the Mm get-go you know you're cooking with the most basic of elements and like the how creative they get with those elements is always Mm -hmm. like whoa that's so cool to me yeah um and then obviously there you know I wouldn't mind a a regular cooking show, but I feel like I'm not as interesting as people around me. <laughs> I don't know about that. Like I, be, I, you know what it is? You're married to Ruth and I feel like he hands things up. So you're not, Ilara and Ruth are both much more yeah. dramatic than you are in a good way. So I think next to them, maybe it might, but it, like, I love when you all do your IG lives and have all your interactions because it feels fun and genuine like you're not doing it for the camera like this is your actual normal life oh yeah um so I don't yeah. know maybe you want to do a family <laughs> I mean my family is all extra the most extra and like even me as a kid my fa- like I was always yelled at for being too loud and too like out there so everyone's like oh Ilar's just a piece of you and I feel like <laughs> I've calmed down like I've in- become more introvert over time mm-hmm. but yeah well, cool. Well, if that show ever happens, I totally want to say, and it's neat because that whole archaeological piece you're talking about would actually be part of this whole village cooking yeah. um, concept. So yeah. yeah, that sounds like a great show. You should just call Padma and <laughs> ask her. Wish. Or Mindy. Out there. Like, <laughs> hey, Mindy, here's an idea. I mean, you have connections. I'm just saying. Yeah. <laughs> like I could put it out there in the world. Um, yeah make it happen uh I don't know I've always I I like experiencing food with other people versus by myself that's how Mm -hmm. I've always been probably due to like growing up in a family of 500 but I want to I want to like talk and cook but talk with someone else not just at a camera Mm -hmm. yeah like when um there was that show Selena plus chef yeah yeah I love that yeah. But it would be the other way around where it would just be me uh, teaching other rando people how to cook. Right, right. Or celebrities, like who knows? <laughs> um, going back to marriage. So is, is Ruth Gujarati also? I wasn't sure. He is. He's Gujarati. Yeah. Um, but his family is like a really unique background where like his mom's side of the family was uh, in Myanmar. Uh, and hmm. I guess back then Burma. And then immigrated over during World War II. And then his dad's side was in uh, Pakistan pre oh, Okay. Uh, so I joke that he's Gujarati by mistake. <laughs> so when you, like in general in Brown culture, the central focus is like 
you are supposed to get married. But I feel like what I, at least for me growing up, um, we were all told, me and all my friends, we're not supposed to be dating. We need to finish our education, get a good job. Then you think about marriage. And when I lived up north, like most people weren't even thinking about marriage till late 20s. And maybe 28 to 30, you like look for a spouse. So I got married. I met my husband. I was 21 and everybody was shocked. I got married. I just turned 23. They're like, what? How did that happen? And because none of my friends got married for like years. Um, So, and I don't know if in your culture, you were told, well, we'll do introductions. Um, Maybe you could choose somebody for yourself. Does any of this like echo your story? Uh, uh, Complete opposite. In the sense that arranged marriage was the only option. Every single wow. one of my cousins got arranged marriages, except for me. In New Jersey? Yeah. They all went to India, wow. maybe junior, senior year of college, married a doctor. Wow. I'm Every shocked. Every brother-in-law of mine is a doctor, except for Ruth. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I did all not were married doctors. They all had arranged marriages. Um, my parents... We're like, okay, as soon as you finish school, you're going to move back home and we're going to find someone for you. Mm -hmm. I clearly was not about that life. Uh, (laughs) uh, They never really, like I had boyfriends in college. But they they knew about? They they knew, but they didn't want to admit that they knew. Like, because they weren't this. Don't ask, don't tell. Yeah, very much so. They weren't this, but why is this, why is Steve around all the time? (laughs) <laughs> when right. someone visit you, <laughs> like, oh, Steve's helping you put the AC in your room. <laughs> but um, Root was the first person I actually like properly introduced to my parents, mostly because a month in, he wanted me to like go to Alabama and meet his parents. And I was like, you're out of your dang mind. Absolutely not. Because um, I knew that if I introduced him to my parents, my parents would be like, okay, let's set the dates. Right. Right. And I was not about that life just yet. I was like just 21 or 22, no, 22 at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, and then he like sat my parents down and was like, listen, we just graduated. We're just figuring out our lives. We're not ready to get engaged, let alone get married. We're just getting to know each other. Mm-hmm. And like the pressure was really from like my aunts and uncles, like he's just using her for time pass. Are you sure? Like, He's going to, you know, want to be with her. Da, 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 da. His family's educated. Your family is not. That kind of stuff. Um, and he had, like, a very open, honest, com- like, conversation with my parents. And, like, told them, like, I'm not going to leave her, but I'm also not going to marry her, like, tomorrow. Right. You're figuring it out. Exactly. And we did that for three years. Um, <laughs> and then he, like, proposed. But, I mean, I did everything asked backwards for in my family which is like we dated openly like he came to all the family functions the baby showers engagement parties all of it then we moved to San Francisco together bought a home together got engaged and then you know went on um it was all out of whack but after my entire family got to know Root they're like oh we couldn't have chosen better Hmm. like you chose someone better than we could have chosen that's great Um, and the wedding was way more fun because like they knew root and they know his personality at that point like Mm -hmm. he more gets into my family way more than even I do my family's all jokesters and like hams (laughs) so like he just gets on with them um so it was like an extreme celebration because everyone knew him everyone like it was just way more fun that way I feel yeah Um, but yeah, I just thought I was going to get some sort of arranged marriage or I was going to run away with someone because we have had that in my family too. I had Masi that ran away. Did she ever come back? That ran away like before their weddings to be with their boyfriends. Yeah. Did they come back though? And then one did not. Hmm. One did. Yeah. So, I mean, like. I was like, well, I guess I'm out of here, you know, like if it, if yeah. they say no. but luckily I never came to that. I don't think my parents would have ever been my, like getting to my parents as an adult. I realized a lot of things they did is because one, they didn't know any better or two, they were following the advice of other people mm-hmm. um, who also didn't know any better, but felt right. like they did. Um, right. But they're yeah. way less orthodox, like 
than I thought they were. Mm -hmm. Um, So with your marriage and even with your career, like all your choice, living in California, do you, do you struggle with honoring your parents as you're like going, you know, trying to think about all these choices that you're making for yourself, for your family? Honestly, no. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I've always been very stubborn and strong headed. Mm -hmm. And I would tell my parents, trust that you raised me right. That I'm not going to make stupid decisions for myself. Mm -hmm. Um, And I'm very logical. I mean, you could tell in many of my IG lives, I'm the more logical, like you need to quiet down. You need to pay attention. Like I've always been that person. Right. I don't mess around. Like there's a time for messing around. There's time for being like serious. And these are things I thought like I'm serious about and I'm not gonna like, if anything, I feel like I've also been my parents' caretaker for most of my life. So I'm like, <laughs> it'll be fine. Yeah. And your sister's in that area. Well, all the yeah. relatives are in that area. So yeah, all of them. they have lots of family to help it, help them out with anything. Exactly. I have so many cousins. Like if they need anything, my sister's going to move out of Jersey soon to Tennessee. Uh, huh? Yeah, to Nashville. Um, so... I'm not stressed. I have so much family. All my cousins, they treat my parents like their parents. Like Mm -hmm. my dad needs anything and my mom needs anything. I know they're taken care of. Yeah. I'm not stressed about that. Yeah. Uh, When it comes to like honoring them, I mean, I'm not going to go on TV and like, you know, in a bra and jetty. What's the translation of that? uh, Bra and underwear. Like I'm not going to be on TV doing foolish stuff. Right. You know what I mean? Um, But I'm, I feel like I've done my best and I'm not going to like do anything to make them look bad or even my in-laws look bad. Right. Right. It feels like you've created the life that you've been wanting or like you keep learning. Right. So there are little yeah, steps. It's, in the it's very much, I do what I want to do. And yeah. I, I would tell my parents, I'm like, I'm not asking your permission. I'm telling you out of respect. Right. I'm giving you this information so you don't hear it otherwise. Exactly. Like I did it when I went to college. I'm the first person in my family to go away for college. All my cousins stayed home. And Same. Then yeah. I didn't apply yeah. anywhere close by. So Same. there was no choice. I'm out of here. Yeah. <laughs> um, and my parents were like, no, you must go to Rutgers. Like, Sorry. I wasn't accepted there because I didn't and, apply there. Yeah. I was like, no, I don't want to go there. I want to go elsewhere. And like, I convinced them to let me go. And I went and it was fine and it worked out. And, um, I think it just took them some time to realize, like, I've been taking care of myself for a very long time prior. I can take care of myself by myself after, you know, like my parents both worked. I was a latchkey kid. Um, like I had the skills to take care of myself. Mm -hmm. Mm Yeah. Um, switching gears, one of the things that has been really cool is as I've seen you, you just seem like you're so thirsty and hungry to learn like everything. And so I see that in your travels. Um, and part of like my brand, just soul food, like I think nourishing your soul is really important holistically. So I do it through food, but then also faith, um, things that are going to be encouraging for you. So one of the questions that I ask our guests, is especially you, because um, it's been fascinating to see you explore world cultures and world religions. And I think you had mentioned Root is really excited about that as well. So you've been to the Middle East, you've mm-hmm. like posted stories uh, that have highlighted different r- religions. Has there been any specific faiths or belief systems that has informed your outlook in life? I think honestly, a little bit of everything for me, um, there's like aspects of like Jewish culture that I really like the whole, you know, the Shabbat, how they do make time to get together. Um, but then there's this aspect of like, there is no perfect Jew. You I've seen, I have friends that are like literally from Orthodox to just like, you know, I'll only celebrate Rosh Hashanah or any big holiday. Yeah. Then I have friends that, you know, only eat kosher or, you know, uh, observe Shabbat and all that stuff every week. 
but none of them will ever say that someone's more Jewish than the other. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I've always found that fascinating with Jewish people that the whole range is accepted as being Jewish. Exactly. There's no like you're a bad Jew or you're bad at this. Like it's you're Jewish and you're Jewish. That's it. And I, I really love that. And I think, um, that's something I wish I had growing up as like in, it was like, oh, you're a bad Hindu. If you, you know, do this, that, the other. Um, and I never fully understood it or like, I, I was like, all right, well, if I can't be the perfect Hindu, then I'm just going to be agnostic. Mm-hmm. And I'll be nothing. That's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I've also in, like, really like, like there's things that I, I've, uh, enjoy about all of it yeah um, I love you know when it comes to Islam the prayer calls I love I you could you could hear them when I was in and when I was in India we lived right near a mosque so like you could hear them in the morning uh-huh. I love it Root loves like Gawali music and um Sufi music so like there's aspects of the arts of it too that like the mm-hmm. religious arts of it that I enjoy um yeah. But I always just, I always have been interested in various religions, why people believe what they believe. Um, And I think it stems from like, I went to um, this program growing up called Swadhyay, which is like a Hindu, kind of like a Sunday school. But when I went, it was run by this um, man, uh, Bandurang Shastri, which we all called Dada, which means grandfather. Mm -hmm. But we had have these camps every year where you take over basically a college campus and mm-hmm. there'd be all these people the same age as you who are a part of Swadhyay um from across the U.S. like three or four thousand of us um and every day you have something on session so you go to a classroom and you discuss and a lot of the times I remember I don't remember what year it was like second or third year of camp where um you start learning about different religions mm-hmm. And then it turns into philosophy. So we learned about like Machiavellian philosophy and Socrates and all the different philosophies there are. And I so appreciated that. I don't yeah. know if they do that anymore. I don't think they do, to be honest, because it's hmm. over by someone else. Uh-huh. Um, and there's still a lot of like Hindu, um, like, what do you call it? The, the, the propaganda that's going on now uh, in India. Mm-hmm. But uh yeah, for me growing up, we learned quite a bit. And also in school, my school had some good diversity education. Mm, um, yeah. So we celebrated Chinese New Year and we celebrated Hanukkah and we celebrated like all the holidays. Um, and we had kids from every, every area that would do something. Um, but what I've learned is like everyone has something to believe in. Mm-hmm. And I don't think, and what I've learned is also it's man that, corrupts it Mm -hmm. I totally agree yeah um I was talking to Sam for about faith and she's like just be a good person (laughs) yeah that's literally the point of everything every religion the point is just be a good person and make good choices treat people with love like yeah yeah. exactly and I and I think it ends up getting corrupted obviously through translation through you know people translating various religions so that it um, benefits them and their means. Mm -hmm. And I think over time, like, if you look, just look at the root base of everything, it's all just be a good person, make good choices, treat others nicely. That's be brave when you have self issues, like here are the things you can think about and consider. But I don't think I would ever as an adult now, join a temple or uh you know a an institution institution. yeah Uh, yeah Yeah. um nor is it something I want you are growing up in right I love how you are about justice and I feel like a lot like that's how I grew up as in, in our in the Christian church that it actually is about justice, though if you watch the news, you wouldn't know. <laughs> and so I think that's one thing that I was drawn to is like, you are all about like treating people with respect, with dignity. And when there's unjust situations that you speak up for it 
you um, defend those who need the help. So yeah, so I was just curious because I think different faiths try to incorporate that, taking care of those in poverty, you know, those types of things. So, well, cool. We are getting close to the end. One question I ask everybody is, if you had a choice for just one, would it be chai, tea, coffee, or another beverage? Ooh, it would be cha. Yeah. I'm a cha girl. It's, How I would, do you take yours? I do like a little bit of water with my cha, boil it with the sugar and the spices, and then add like two cups of milk. Wow. Like it's way more milk than it is water because I yeah. like it to be a milky tea. And then I add... <clears throat> I used to do homemade cha masala, but I really love the diaspora coat cha masala. Uh-huh. So I use their cha masala and then um, simmer it up the walls of the pan three times. And then- Oh, you're a triple girl. Yes. And then strain. Um, and then for Ilar, I'll do the same thing, but I'll top hers off with cold milk. Mm. It's like not as deeply caffeinated. <laughs> yeah. No, as a kid, I love drinking chaya. Yeah. And our chaya had no- spices growing up so I we do the feral method of boiling the milk and the water together with the mm -hmm. tea leaves and only if it was like a special occasion we might put cardamom mm -hmm. um so like masala chai or putting ginger I'll, I never oh. knew that was a thing until I learned about other parts of India oh my god so, no you like change my mom would change what goes in it seasonally so like springtime it was mint wintertime oh. it was um uh what do you call ginger summer was either mint or lemongrass um or green tea like a mix mm -hmm. but yeah it, it would and then fall would be like you know anise cardamom etc um yeah. clove but yeah it would change with the season based on like uh, my mom was super into ayurveda she's still okay like, yeah super deeper into ayurveda so it's very much about like the season and like what your body needs in that season. That makes sense. Okay. Yeah. Cause as you say, those it's different spices, cooling. it makes sense for those seasons. Yeah. Okay. Like fennel is cooling. Thus it would be a summer mint is cooling. Thus spring, um, ginger is warming, warm property and antimicrobial. So that would be a winter thing. So like there was a lot of, she definitely had us eating very ayurvedically growing up. Yeah. Still so tries yeah. to this day. We yeah. joke around. We're like, mommy, if my if Ilara is sick, I'm like, mommy, I think you need to juice some uh uh bitter melon leaves and some onions and then let it sit in her belly button for 10 minutes and then let her drink it. Like joke around wow. with her. Because <laughs> she would do it. She would like it's like I can see that though. Juice some bitter melon leaves and be like, drink this. And I'm like, heck no. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Were there special concoctions after you gave birth that you're supposed to drink nothing to drink but it was a lot of like mukwas which is like the seeds that you would have mm -hmm. so the seeds would be a mixture of chia flax um and uh sesame seeds uh -huh. toasted together with like turmeric and a little bit of black salt and then she would make um a, it's a dessert it's like a almost like a little bar made with um fenugreek seeds uh -huh. Oh. And your Greek is lactogenic. Um, and it's stupid bitter and sweet at the same time. I am not a fan of it, so I didn't eat it. Yeah. Um, so then she, I would tell him, like, listen, if you just use real fenugreek, I'll eat it. So then she would get, like, from the store, actual fenugreek leaves, fresh mm -hmm. fenugreek. And she would make me, like, um, dips or um, chutneys and different things with that. Mm. that's like a super lactogenic item um yeah but like fen and guar gum the, the other was a sweet made with guar gum um which is um also very lactogenic yeah you have to like deep fry the resin until it gets really like puffy almost like it almost looks like freeze-dried food like pop rocks ah wow and then you blend it because at that point when it when you fry it up it puffs uh -huh. becomes more fragile okay and you could blend that up and then you put that in like the sukri which is like a nut based sweet that's gujarati where it's like toasted um ghee jaggery nut powders and um you can add the guar gum and it gives it like this like crackly texture hmm. 
sticks to your teeth, but it's supposed to be good for you when you. Oh. Yeah, it. these are all things I know nothing about. Yeah. So it's <laughs> interesting. I'm, I'm not salivating and wishing I had it either, but I want to learn about these things. So bad. Yeah. The Mukhlas wasn't bad either. I didn't mind that either. We actually, I still have jars of it because we really likes it. So we like, we both eat it. Yeah. Um, but oh, I hated the the bitter like fenugreek stuff. Mm. <laughs> um, before you were talking about gardening, do you have a curry leaf plant? No, but I'm working on it. I'm gonna. Yeah. So my soil needs um, it's all clay based. So we need to mm -hmm. amend it and like get the soil healthy, um, before I can put any plants in there. Mm -hmm. so I'm working on getting some like healthy soil up, and then getting a curry tree from Kula Nursery, which is. <laughs> Um, owned by um, my friend Z, and she grows um, South Asian heirloom mm -hmm. and fruits. So she has like Pakistani mulberries and uh, babri and um, all these like gourds that I've never heard of from South India. Wow. Like, yeah. Melons and gourds that I never had, but they look really cool. Yeah. Um, like things I've heard of that goes in somewhere, but I've never had mm. the only uh, big thing that we would use is drumstick um yeah. in our sambar yeah. uh and then the bitter gourd of uh, pavica tarella maybe they call it in the north yeah yeah, um, yeah. looks like a porcupine yeah yeah yeah, um, yeah. but, but yeah, it was just like super interesting different like cucumbers and stuff that i've again never had mm -hmm. but um she has a massive curry leaf like operation Farm. that i'm yeah. like which me are we we were in this article, I think Food 52, talking about curry leaves. Um, so she was in it, Margaret Pack in Chicago that just opened that to Chicago. Um, so we like keep posting about our curry leaf adventures and how they're growing. And um, most of us take ours in and out of the house. Yeah, yeah. And it's not gonna do well mm -hmm. outside. And then Sam Ford had suggested stripping the whole thing every winter when you bring it in. We're like, that sounds so scary. But Margaret and I did it, and within a month, like all these leaves started growing. We're like, it's a miracle. Sam's it's a it's genius. I love she her. is. Well, she's like the the Sri Lankan aunties or the ones that yeah. told her about it. So I was just telling another person, like, just do it. Just believe in the pro. I mean, your leaves are looking bad anyway. You have nothing to lose. Just strip it and start over. And so, yeah, I'm preaching the gospel of stripping curry leaf plants now. Interesting, because my mom brings them in, and hers are pretty like insane my friend oh my god so my best friend her husband has two curry leaf trees they are the size of like cows <laughs> no I believe it because my parents this too. is outdoors in Pennsylvania wow in ground and they're the most like I've never seen a more like pro like prodigiously like curry leaf making plant in my life like it was insane and I was like can I have some and I took like yeah. four bags full of curry leaves from his house um which I'm probably gonna be like hey can you sit I'm still going through them <laughs> they freeze wow. them. and I was like yeah oh, these are forever yeah. but yeah I hope to have a big like in the landscaping my idea is to have a lot of Indian stuff so patra which is kokosia leaves something I'm gonna grow um, I seeded a bunch of seeds um, at Kula Nursery a month ago, I would say, um, which it was, I got bottle gourd, did I grow papri, surti papri, guar, and oh, it was like five or six different types of plants, but put those in, hopefully, oh, uh, tuar, uh, tuar lentils, um, so she's taking care of my babies right now. Yeah. And sends me pictures every once in a while. Aww. Um, the hope is to like take a couple and bring them and plant them here. Mm -hmm. But then also we, it was a lot. It was like, I think eight or nine plants per. So I was like, let's save some of it and do like a pop-up at the end of the year where I do like mm. a pop-up. That'd be really cool. Yeah. So yeah. once it starts producing, I'm going to have to go and like figure out like how I'm going to save some of it, my like, you know, chop it up and freeze it. So that end of the year, we can bring it all together and do something. Yeah. 
Yeah. That's a fun plan. I definitely, I love living here in Tennessee, but when I hear about like all the Bay Area things, because it's a different flavor when there's like Northeast things, but like the community that you have up there of um, they see women owned businesses, uh, the ways that you all interact with each other and support. I'm like, I'm out here. <laughs> so it's definitely fun to watch you all doing life together. And yeah. Yeah, um, I, we're very lucky that like we have each other and we're all so different, but also like there's no sense of competition. It's very I much- I get like, that, yeah. We're all best friend kind of vibe. <laughs> yeah, there's enough business to go around. When there's no need for competition. I mean, how many coffee companies are there? And it's like, there's, there's enough for everybody. Oh, 100. Yeah. Is there anything that you have coming up that you'd like to share? So I'm working on cookbook two, which will come out next fall. So we got a little bit of wait, but I am working on that. Um, and then outside of that, hopefully just kind of getting this book done possible tv appearance we'll see it's one of those things where like you talk and you talk and you talk and then you never know it's kind of how like i feel like tv slash hollywood works is like yeah don't trust that anything's gonna happen until anything's signed and then it almost feels like hey can you be here monday yep wait, yep it's hurry up, and wait. It's, <laughs> right. yeah, hurry up and wait yeah um but yeah we're slowly kind of getting through it through the house through the book potential tv opportunities but yeah yeah well exciting thank you again for joining me it's been fun to watch your journey but even having this conversation hearing more about your background and yeah please keep doing what you're doing because it's such an encouragement to me oh thank you so much i appreciate it and thank you all for joining us on this episode of Being Brown and Bold. You can find all the links for this show at the bottom, and we will be back here next week to drop our next episode. Till then, be wise and be bold.